in a very good place, you know, like... Like, I mean, everything was going really well for me. I just finished a video game and... You know, like, Jackass 2.5 is great. And now, you know, I mean, I've got my own television series, Dr. Steve-O's, uh, head. Yeah. It's like, my rap album's no different. I mean, it's really phenomenal stuff I'm doing, you know, and, like, it's all you have to do is just hear it, and then you'll be amazed. I'm Steve-O and I'm an alcoholic drug addict and simply put, I completely lost control of my life. If I creeped you out before... <laughs> oh my god. I have fun with you. I gotta go. Drugs and alcohol turned me into an absolute douchebag, a complete monster, and I had cameras rolling just about the whole time, all the way to rock bottom. So here it is, an incredibly difficult process of showing the world how bad my drug and alcohol addiction got. Oh. <laughs> Even he feels bad for me. <laughs> through your life? <laughs> Kinda. Steve was born in England to an American father and a Canadian mother. The family historian, my sister Cindy. That is one of the first pictures we've got of Steve. Oh, that was the um, tooth that you lost entirely too soon. This is my first try at walking. You slipped on a stair and smacked your tooth. Um, <laughs> you the boozer. At age two, <laughs> sticking breadsticks up your nose and grabbing somebody's beverage. Just slugging down the booze. I grew up with alcoholism in my family, and I guess I was 12 years old. The first time I really vomited from drinking too much alcohol, which I stole from my parents. Steve got into uh, the family uh, wine and liquor cabinet, and I wrote it off to an isolated experience. I mean, who doesn't experiment with their parents' liquor cabinet? You see the facts long before you accept the reality. And uh, I guess many parents have developed the art of self-deception. I got my first skateboard in 1985 when I was 11 years old. And when I was 15 years old, my dad won a video camera in a golf tournament. And ever since then, my entire life has been pretty well documented on video, oh for better or worse. I am completely crazy. You know it, baby. The first time I smoked pot, I was 16 years old. And from that point on, I smoked pretty much every day. And by the time I was 17 years old, I was taking acid on the way to high school in the morning. I remember, like, being very young, and everything I looked up to was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. My life really turned into a pursuit of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. When I got to college, I just felt like, man, I'm not cut out for this, you know? Like, I can't do it. Like, I couldn't bring myself to go to class. I couldn't bring myself to study. I mean, it was like fail out or drop out. And those were my options. And I just thought, man, what am I going to do with my life? Steve doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> the only thing I was really familiar with and did well was videotape stupid stunts. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to be the craziest guy in the world. It's going to be great. I'm going to be a stuntman. Yeah! I'll never forget when Steve told us that he wanted to be a stuntman. Why in the world would anybody want to do that? 
I wanted the shortest distance between me and the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. Like it was either going to become successful at what I was doing with the video camera, or I was going to die trying to make it successful. He was either going to end up incarcerated, dead, or famous, and we really didn't know what. When I was 20 years old, I had this run of really bad luck, which is how I would describe it. You know, I kept getting hospitalized when I was drunk. There was an incident where I threw myself off this balcony and landed on my face on the concrete, breaking my cheekbone. I broke seven teeth. I had 10 stitches in my chin and a broken wrist. And I still had the cast on my wrist when I got arrested for my first DUI. And I called up my mom and I said, hey, um, I'm in jail, I got arrested for DUI. So my mom said, have a good time in there because I'm not gonna bail you out unless you go directly to rehab. And it was mom's call and I think it was part of the condition of getting bailed out and um, it didn't take. Anytime you go to rehab for someone else's benefit, like I was there to make my mom happy, um, it's not gonna work. You know, you gotta really want to get better. And uh, I didn't even feel like I had a problem to begin with. From the point when I bailed out of the University of Miami, I was homeless for three years and in high gear filming stunts with my video camera. And over the course of those three years, it became clear that I wasn't really getting anywhere towards being a coming a stuntman. So I found out about Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Clown College, that it was free to get into, it had no tuition. Clown College was statistically harder to get into than Harvard. Over 2,000 people applied and only 30 got in. And I thought, if I can just get the name Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey associated with me in any way, then all of this stupid crap I've been doing with a video camera will somehow become legitimate. They didn't pick me for the circus after I graduated from Clown College, and I was kind of bummed about that. But uh, it made sense, you know? Like, I wanted to be a stuntman, and they were looking for clowns. <laughs> but ultimately, I got a job in this flea market circus. <laughs> the flea market circus that I worked in would do two shows on Friday, three shows on Saturday, and three shows on Sunday. And typically, I would do cocaine through all of them without sleeping in it. I was a cocaine-addicted clown in a flea market circus. My last time performing professionally as a circus clown was the day that I puked up the goldfish for MTV. I want to swallow this goldfish and puke him into the bowl. I first met Steve-O when I was making Big Brother Skateboarding Magazine. And he would just send me photos and footage all the time of him just doing just the most outrageous stunts. So when we started Jackass, Steve-O was one of the first people I called. I just knew he would be perfect for the show. As soon as my goldfish trick played on MTV once, I became recognizable the next day. Two minutes of FaceTime, which changed my life forever. Yeah. Yeah. Once Jackass hit the air, it was instantaneous. I mean, it was just this weird instant hit. So I packed up my car and I headed off to California. <laughs> Am I comfortable with my popularity? Yeah. I don't understand. Can you handle it? I don't understand it at all. It's like, it's like, dude, aren't you the guy who stuck his face in elephant? What <laughs> <laughs> a dumb reason for people to think I'm cool. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve O, and this is the Cricket Helmet. Certainly, after I got to California, most of the filming that I did for Jackass was always with no sleep and still going from like a day or two. It would be Steve O awake for four days straight, just going for it on anything that he could find. And then he would literally crash for like 48 hours. <laughs> it's just a banana. And then he would just wake up and go back for more. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, this is the tequila stuntman. I knew it. Throw it down, throw it down, throw it down, throw it down. Well, I wouldn't choose his line of work for an addict. Uh, addicts tend to be highly thrill seeking. They tend to be, you know, stuntmen and race car drivers and extreme athletes. And so there's no surprise that an addict would be attracted to the kind of work that he does. Slowly but surely, I seem to be becoming a borracho. The problem, uh, I would say, is that, uh, you know, the drug and alcohol use was sort of glamorized by the stuff he was doing and, and, and maybe even necessary to do what he was doing. 
so it certainly worked against being sober. Oh, yeah, dude, that's total booze, man. <laughs> you know, with us, it's a fine line because everyone's partying hard. You know, who do you single out? Like, you know, you, people point their fingers at me. I'll go pretty big out at night sometimes, but you got to know when you can turn it off. And Steve didn't have any downtime. Like, when he wasn't shooting, he started doing these tours, like these stage shows and bats every night and mayhem. Now I'm going to really myself up. Are you ready? It was never really about, like, having skills or showing talent. It was more just about how wasted and crazy can I get. I don't have a drinking problem. I have a drinking career. <laughs> As Steve-O became famous, you know, he was pretty open about enjoying weed and booze and partying. And, you know, pretty soon, if that's what you're putting out there, that's what comes back. Steve-O, in particular, created this legendary party animal persona that he had to live up to everywhere he went. I think part of it was natural. I think naturally he was that guy, but part of it, too, was just playing the role that you were expected to play. All my wildest dreams came true. Like, I'm famous and rich. And all the cliches, like, about fame and fortune are all true. Yeah, once Steve-O got some money, you know, Coke's expensive. Like, before that, he didn't have the kind of money to afford, like, doing, like, big amounts of coke. And then once he, uh, once he started getting some paychecks, some spare cash, he could do a lot more. Ooh. He'd like to do coke all night and then into the next day and talk and talk and talk. Mostly about himself. So what's going on, fellas? We're just trying to make a buck, man. Let's do it. <laughs> By the time we did the second movie, he was doing a lot of cocaine, and I had done Wild Boys with him and knew that... I don't like Steve-O when he's on cocaine. Cocaine's just bad news. And it got so out of control that uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get along with everyone in film number two, and I just I had to do something about it. So I told everyone I was going to quit. And Steve-O promised no cocaine the whole movie. Yeah! I have it in writing in an email. I made it through number two without doing cocaine, and I lasted for a year and six days total before I got back on the cocaine again and started right where I left off, if not worse. Steve-O always really latches on to any family type of atmosphere. When we're doing Jackass, he's got us and that family. And when he's doing Wild Boys, he's got that family. But when Jackass number two was done, you know, we all kind of went our separate ways for a little bit. And then Steve O's really left without a family. And as soon as Jackass and Wild Boys was behind me, I had nothing left but drunk and loaded on drugs. Woo, well, yeah! It's rock and roll, baby! <laughs> See how professional I am? <laughs> Woo, that's what I do. I get totally stoned and then I make money being an <laughs> Woo, yeah! <laughs> After we got done filming Jackass number two and before it came out was when the nitrous started coming to my house in cases of 600 of these whippets. I remember walking in his house and it looked like thousands to me. I mean, he would sit there and he would do whippets back to back to back to back to back to back. Like I got so fast at putting these cartridges into that container, like faster than I breathe. Like I, I wasn't even breathing air. And I remember thinking like, man, this can't be good for me. Like, like I got, I'm killing myself with this stuff. I've seen a number of uh, cases of nitrous addiction. It causes a, a, a mania. I've seen manic psychoses. People get very, very dis disorganized and crazy on it. It can cause a what's called an ascending polyneuropathy, where you lose feeling and motor function in your legs and unfold up to your neck, and you end up on a breathing machine. You can also have cardiac arrhythmias and die suddenly. I felt like going to the Jackass number two premiere like I was showing up at my own funeral. You know, I just thought, nothing's gonna be this big anymore. No matter which way you slice it, everything's gonna be downhill from this point. I was so afraid of the spotlight going away that I 
It was like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? Outdo myself for the paparazzi all the time. What can I get on TMZ? Steve-O loves being in front of the camera so much that he will just film himself. You know, it's easy enough. As bad as things got, like, I just hold up in my apartment a lot of the time. I mean, I don't know, I was just so afraid of cameras stopping rolling. I'm Steve-O, and stay tuned for a whole bunch more jackass crap. We were gonna get everybody together to shoot these jackass promos for MTV, and I really hadn't seen the guys for a few months. And Steve-O shows up and he's fat. Even your tattoo gained 15 pounds on your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm fat. It's a... <laughs> he put on the cheetah and tried to do some tricks on a skateboard, and he couldn't land one trick. <sighs> He was like breathing hard and couldn't catch his breath. It was really sad when Steve-O showed up to do those commercials that day. That was a turning point to me to see like, wait a minute, he's not fun-loving, super talented guy that just likes to get drunk at the bar. He's, he's a problem right now because now his, his actual skill set is being affected. But no one ever thought it would get as out of hand as it did. You know, he just lost touch with all of us and started hanging out with these people. He started rapping. What the hell was that? There's a new boy in town, and I don't like to frown. That's why I lay it down. Hey, Steve-O's a gangster. I was just clamoring for some way to reinvent myself. I was trying to do this comedy rap career, and uh, I got signed to Universal Records to make a comedy gangster rap album. Hope the smoke the kush, flip the bitch over and tap the tush. The rap album was the worst thing that ever happened to him. His preconceived notions about what you had to be like to do rap, that was the darkest, most awful time. And that's where he completely stopped being funny. I got guns. Murder is fun. Shoot everyone. Just get it done. <laughs> For a long time there, he was trying to get arrested because... He thought it would help his rap career. So he needed to get arrested to get some street cred. And he just couldn't get arrested. What just happened there, Steve? Oh, that's cool, man. They just wanted to make sure I didn't have that weed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think the cops got in more trouble than he did. Steve was a gangster. <clears throat> The rap thing, that's when Steve was at his worst. It brought Steve into a subculture that accentuated his drug and alcohol problem. The rap thing made me insecure, okay? Maybe I did a lot of drugs, a lot of class A street narcotics, PCP, ketamine, and tons of nitrous, tons of everything. Ooh. <laughs> It was stuff I didn't even really never heard of. You know, I'm from the hood. I thought I knew everything. I mean, I saw some, some stuff with Steve that I never even saw before. Whoops. <laughs> it's like he went crazy for a time. I mean, completely psycho. Where the f did that come from, dude? What? <laughs> When I'm huffing nitrous, there's literally people in my head, like ghosts, people. They talk to me, they project So they're telling me, huff a lot of nitrous and hold your breath, Steve, but don't be a and suffocate yourself. <clears throat> I can't let down the liquid people. I uh, would carry on conversations with voices that I heard in my head. Just crazy stuff. Like, I, I would be thinking in dialogue, which I heard audibly. <laughs> to this day, I feel like what that meant is that I just crossed this line into the spirit world. And, like, honestly, there was just a battle going on over me between demons and angels. You have no idea that like, there's people in my head, too. It's like, so crazy. I mean, what's your name, anyway? 
I was possessed by demons, and I think that that's pretty evident in some of this footage. I want to be dead. I was at death's door. Like, I was at death's door, and I guess, like, the good I saw in that was that I was going to be reunited with my mom. <laughs> Love you, Mom. On October 10th of 1998, my mom suffered a serious aneurysm, and it left her horribly mentally and physically disabled, and she suffered in a big way for her last five years. And to see her in that condition, it just cut right through his soul. I mean, it was awful. And that just messed me up. Like, uh, I mean, it still messes me up. I have this problem with my mom died. She cried for her last five years. I just want to make her pain never have happened. And I went on this berserk rampage trying to get in a time machine. I destroyed my whole place. <laughs> Not enough gigs. Useless. See this? Completely useless. I love you, Mom. And I did all this for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? 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 Yeah, what? welcome back. What? Too late on that. Steve-O. Steve-O in I studio tonight. The drugs and alcohol threatened his future. Certainly he turned off people that were influential in sponsorships and programming. Steve has uh, had, had a couple of glasses of Chardonnay. And I will tell you, bitch. All right. That was kind of scary. I mean, first of all, for Adam to have to fight a guest is, is a weird thing to start with. But then when he really, like, cut himself and then didn't even seem aware of the fact that blood was gushing out of his body, you know, it didn't seem like he was headed in, in a good direction. We'll get security. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh... He uh, reached a point where he was evicted from sets and unable to complete stuff that he started. He was headed to a disaster. I just sit in my house just piling all the narcotics into my body that I possibly can. Namely ketamine, nitrous oxide, PCP, cocaine, <laughs> you know. And I just get all kinds of results. February 23rd, it's almost noon. So everybody from Jackass went to New York for the 24-hour takeover of the MTV studios. And it was like, all right, we're gonna fight to stay awake for 24 hours. And like, I'd already been awake for 24 hours and I stayed up for another 24 hours after they kicked me off the set. It's like popping bills, dude. I'm really good at it. <laughs> I really hadn't seen or hung out with Steve-O in the three or four months leading up to the 24 hour takeover. That's when I was forced to deal with Steve-O in his current state. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, wor I'm, wor I'm working on uh, some rhymes, some rhymes. He was wrecked on a bunch of stuff. Get your pages in order. Let's <laughs> kick it. Oh, man, okay. Are you ready? Oh, no, 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 okay. I was worried about all of them, if you want to know the truth. I was worried about all of them, but when I saw Steve-O, I knew he was in rare form. It's not easy being a gangster rapper, especially when you're white. I think he ended up getting thrown out. Is that right? Thrown out? Wow. If you get thrown out of a jackass thing, that's bad. I'm okay, I'm okay, yeah. But I'm really not in my sweatshirt, though. I'm really okay, I'm better than okay. All right. Yeah. I went up to him and I said, Steve, oh, man, I'm worried about you. This, is, this isn't like fun, festive party stuff. This is dark, you know, like me worried about you kind of stuff. If anybody tried to tell me, like, that I had a problem and I needed to get help, it would either make me furious or make me laugh or just make me tune out. But uh, nobody could tell me I kind of got to the point, even after I'd realized the gravity of the problem, where I had to bite my tongue and suffer through it and hope for the best. Hey, what did it say in the Bible? Be good to thy neighbor! That's all I'm trying to do, pal. All I'm trying to do. I had this neighbor who called the cops on me all the time because I was loud and disrespectful and my place was this nightmare. I mean, 
I wasn't an ideal neighbor to have, ever, let alone when the downward spiral really kicked into high gear. I dare you to call the cops. Guy kept complaining, calling and complaining, and cops kept coming. The neighbors called to complain about the noise. I know. Um, it was a little bit loud, so just tone it down. For sure. Are cool, so. Right on, man. Thank you, guys. You calling the cops on me when I'm not even allowed. This war ensued where I was pounding on the wall, jamming stuff through the wall into his apartment, being a nightmare at his door. And I hate my neighbor! Get out of this building! Actually, thank you for calling the cops so much so that I got so much good footage. Yeah, call the cops. The cops are coming upstairs right, right now. Cool. He did call the cops. Yeah, you guys are more than welcome to come on right in. For safety, put the cigarette. Okay, for sure, man. Absolutely, man. I'm the reason one. The cops showed up and arrested me for vandalism with no shirt, no shoes, and a bag of cocaine in my pocket. All right, game on, guys. Game on, guys. How many weapons on you, dude? Not at all. Just gonna search So they find the bag of cocaine and they rearrest me for felony drug possession. After a day and a half in jail, they let me out. Yeah, yeah, dude. You guys have been waiting for a while, huh? Jeez, dude. As soon as I got out of jail, I went straight home where I had more cocaine and ketamine and marijuana and pills and beers and went on this rampage. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm dead sober, you see? And I will deal with you honestly. <laughs> It's not all about you or me. It's about us. See, I'm the guy who just got out of jail. <laughs> Come out of jail, this is good music. <laughs> That's when he got out of jail and the whole episode really started going downhill fast. It really got bad. We love this car. We love this car. We love this car so much. Wait, I'm a like I'm a like I'm a wait. I'm supposed to what? We are going matrix on you bitches. Um see, 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 see. On the top, jump the house, dude. See, were you intoxicated or anything? Not at all. Not at all? Can I take a picture of you? I would love to take a picture of you. Like, I couldn't have tried harder to go straight back to jail with more felony charges. The fact that I didn't get arrested that day is unbelievable to me. We're making a ruckus! A ruckus! I didn't expect to hear from Steve after I dropped him off that night. I thought I wasn't going to hear from him anymore. I thought he was, was gone. When all the media came out about me being in jail, the apartment complex I was in had enough and they evicted me. I'm getting evicted. Everything's got to be out. Oh, everything's got to be out? Everything's going out. I'm moving out. You get my point? You get my point? He had been sending emails, and these emails had this tone, this tone about life and death and immortality and resignation to the fact that this life sucked, but what happened next was somehow so much better. And it scared the hell out of me. And Dad and Cindy, if you don't see that it's perfectly fine and more than half full, then you're gonna find out that it gets broken! All of a sudden, this one day, we started getting letters with intent to harm himself. He sends out this suicidal sounding email about doing this jump from his apartment. Okay, this is where I'm jumping out off a little Yes, motorcycle. No Harley. It would suck if I fell, but I'd probably survive. 
And Ma, I'm gonna beat you. They had to be there by 10. Or I'm gonna jump out the window and kill myself. I'm ready to die. Knoxville got in the mix, and I told him to do anything he had to do, tie him up, throw him in a car, and take him to the hospital. I just called Jeff, and I was like, I, we, let's just go get him and take him to get help. I found out we can do this thing called a 5150, where we can take somebody who is losing it and put him in a hospital, and they'll just evaluate him for 72 hours. Knoxville wrote me back, 10 a.m., what's with the early call times? Sheesh. And I'm like, okay, all right, noon. <laughs> you know? And I had no idea that I was scheduling my own intervention. Like, the guys showed up with no cameras, no nothing. They just showed up and they said, there's eight of us and there's one of you. You're going in for a psychiatric evaluation. Steve-O's never been the most aggressive guy. He kind of looked around and was like, okay. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not much of a fighter. You know, he wanted to film it. He was like, yeah, rad, guys. And he's like, wait, why don't any of you guys have cameras? And so he popped his camera out. Like, I'm going to film my own intervention. <laughs> and knocks him, just knocks this camera out of my hand. No. And there's this one frame, if you look at it, like you can see this look on Knoxville's face. Everyone's seen him in such incredible agony, but he's never had such a pained look on his face that I've ever seen, except in that one shot. The jackass guys, um, they did what we couldn't do. Um, we could make a plan, we could have it all ready to go, but we couldn't get Steve to go. They threw him in a car, brought him to the hospital, and that saved his life, for sure. The day of my intervention, I went to the psychiatric ward. When I, when I showed up at the psych ward, it was for a 72-hour hold. But when they saw the emails I'd been writing, it was like, okay, that's two weeks. And then he came to us. That was at Cedars. Then he came over to Los Encinas uh, and came into treatment. I stayed there for 30 days. Then I moved into a sober living, and I was there for like two months. I went from having four apartments in one building to having four dudes in one apartment. <laughs> in the very beginning, when I was first getting sober, the video camera still kind of kept me sane. I'm Steve-O, and I'm gonna attempt to put a shoestring in one nostril and pull it out the other. It's called the uni nostril. Is it going through your sinus hole? Yeah. Septum, is that what it's called? How'd you wind up with a uni nostril in the first place? <laughs> I did too much drugs. I remember thinking, man, like if I gave getting sober a chance, like, I could do a lot of good in the world. And I just thought, like, oh. And at that time, it was all about, I'll become a hero. Like, I'll be this poster child for sobriety. And, like, everyone will just look at me like, what a great guy I am. So there you have it, kids. <laughs> like, uh, doing drugs is not that cool. <laughs> Recovery is about humility, simple acts of service, letting go of grandiosity, having faith that things will be okay when you do let go of grandiosity. And the fact that he hadn't quite turned over his second and third steps the way he should, uh, you know, suggested his recovery was still somewhat shaky. Uh, this is where I live. <laughs> I don't know how lively I am today. After three months had gone by, my world crashed around me, and I just, I was like, ah, I don't want to live. You know, like, I just felt like this worthless, horrible person. And so at that point, I checked myself into another loony bin. And I was in there for three weeks. And it was at that point when I really realized, like, wait a second, like, I'm not getting sober for the benefit of the world at large. Like, I'm getting sober because I desperately needed to create a new history. That I was not cool with being that person that I had turned into. He showed an, an, an amazing willingness when he finally got with it. Can you take a quick Whipped cream now, I'm addicted to nitrous oxide. <laughs> That's when I put down the camera for a few months and just got focused on recovery. He was totally accepting of the rehab then, and he was a completely different person. He really, you know, he just forged on and followed direction and did what he was supposed to do. Very remarkable, unusual, and uh, why he's alive. Once I really got into my head that I was getting sober for myself, 
then things started to improve. I guess during, uh, uh, what do you call it, the 12-step program, there's a step where you have to apologize for things you've done. And the first thing that came to my mind was the way that I went around the world kicking people in the nuts and not letting them kick me back. So I called up Knoxville, and I'm like, dude, I need you to kick me in the nuts. So Knoxville, do we have a deal? <laughs> you want me to kick you in the nuts today? Yeah. It's oh. a genuine freebie. <laughs> Of course we did it naked. I'm gonna kick those old rusty peaches barefooted. <laughs> oh. I'm Steve-O, and I'm an alcoholic drug addict. Don. <laughs> oh, 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 that felt yucky. That's what you get for doing drugs, kids. <laughs> He has this sense that he has done some really bad things. And we don't talk about that much, but he has the sense that he needs to make up for that. No way. First shot. When uh, I first got sober, skateboarding kept me sane, you know? Like, I had skated at rehab. It just felt good, you know, like like that pop shove it foot plant late under flip. Ah, uh, under flipper! <laughs> the first day where I filled out a pass and left the rehab to go out was so that I could film skateboarding on Hollywood Boulevard. Like going out on my skateboard like helped me so much at that time. And uh, I met this little kid. He was so jazzed. Oh, you know, you're I got out of the car and I ran and I said, and I was holding a pen, like, shaking. Zippo, can you get your autograph? <laughs> I gave him my shoes and my skateboard, and he's like, oh. Sweatshirt that I'm really good at? And I'm gonna do it freaking right now. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. 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 My first sober birthday, I had a skateboard party for a bunch of kids, and that was awesome. We all started skating before anyone did anything. You know, we were skating before you were losing or whatever, and you didn't have to do any of that stuff. You just skated. It's my first sober birthday since I was 16 years old. Probably the best one of my life. It's important to me that this whole television show not be perceived as some kind of I'm better and look at me all cured now because I'm never going to be cured and I could wind up loaded tomorrow. I think uh, part of his struggle now is to figure out like can he go out and be rad without <laughs> the drugs and alcohol. Do it! Oh! Steve-O has more challenges than the average celebrity. The average celebrity just being a celebrity is evocative and, and contrary to recovery. But Steve-O, he's very <laughs> His very work has an addictive quality to it. It arouses those uh, addictive centers of the brain. As far as being willing to do like crazy stunts, like it was never alcohol and drugs that made me do that stuff. Oh, dude. The drugs, if anything, toned him down. And without them, he will be so much stronger and I think there are good things ahead. I'm very, very optimistic. Our next guest has made a career of humiliating himself in public, so it seemed only natural that eventually he would wind up ballroom dancing starting March 9th. You can see him sashay for sequin spangled glory on Dancing with the Stars. Please say hello to Steve-O. Uh, whatever they did at that intervention must have worked. I felt like I was meeting Steve-O for the very first time. I don't, uh, I don't know who that person was, but he was uh, a lot more pleasant to be around than the other Steve-O. You're sober now, I, I hear? Yep, 11 months today. I don't think I'm... It's kind of giving me this whole belief, wow, you know, people can change. And to see him just bouncing back, it's, it's awesome. I think you're going to make the season a lot of fun this year. All right. I don't well, think I don't... they've even thought about the fact that you are going to be on live television two <laughs> nights a week on the Disney-owned ABC. <laughs> Everybody with ABC and with Dancing with the Stars, they're all kind of freaked out about what Steve-O might say or do. 
So I've kind of asked him to be a good boy at certain points, but I also want him to be himself, and I'm all for whatever he wants to do. <laughs> okay. And. Like, like, if I wasn't sober, there's no way that I would ever be in a position to go on network television, ballroom dancing. So if I come around into you... I have no idea what I'm getting into, but I'm going to learn how to dance. I think Steve-O has a great shot of going very far in this competition, if not winning. He has a lot to offer, so I can't wait to use everything he can do. <laughs> he's taking it serious. He's in the lab. He's getting ready. I would not be shocked. Steve Wood. Steve and his partner Lacey Swimmer. It's taken a while for the little glint to come back in his eye, but now when he comes in, I see it. Steve has been sober for a year now, you know, and I'm surprised as I am happy. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Steve is already a winner. The progress that's been accomplished in the last year by Steve, his commitment to the recovery, his positive attitude, and uh, all that's gone forward is absolutely phenomenal. I want to make it really clear that uh, this isn't something that you get better from. And uh, I'm not like here to say that I'm cured. Like, um, I'm just here to say that things got really bad for me to the point where I, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober on a daily basis. It's time for the five fingers of doom. Oh. <laughs> then the next game is called the Four Fingers of Doom. <laughs> if you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. When you get knocked down, you gotta get back up. I ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I know enough to know. If you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. If you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. Wasn't I doing darts into your ass last time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.